Well, we're in this series called Imago Dei. Imago Dei simply is Latin for image of God. And um, it means that we are made in God's image. Well, we started out this series talking about the implications of that. What does that mean? How does that affect how we look at life? How does that affect how we live? Last week, we looked at racism and prejudice, that because we're made in the image of God, and so is everyone else, that that has no place in the life of a Christian. Today, I'm going to talk about you were created to serve. And we're going to see this in the creation story. And uh, we've got three more weeks in this series, and I think they're going to be very helpful messages. So I hope you'll not only be here, but you'll invite somebody to join us. If you join us online, invite someone to watch with you, okay? Or better yet, even come and sit with us in the room. I think it'll be a blessing to you. Well, today, we're going to talk about you're created to serve, but we're going to answer one of life's greatest questions. Now, I want you to understand, until you answer this question, you're going to struggle in life. And here's the question, why am I here? Not why are you here in this room at this time, but why are you alive? Why did God create you? Why do you exist? What is your reason for existence? What are you supposed to do while you're here? Until you can answer that question, you're going to drift in life. One of the things that I believe is the reason why there is so much mental illness in our culture today, more than ever in the history of the world, more than ever in the history of our country, more people on medication for mental illness than at any time in world history. And why is that? Well, I believe that one of the reasons is that people don't know why they're here. They've not grappled with this all-important question of what is my purpose in life? And see, until you have a relationship with God and understand what that looks like and what that means, you're going to drift. You're going to struggle with meaning. You're going to be discontented in life. You're going to struggle with your purpose. Without knowing why you're here, who you belong to, and what your purpose is, you're going to search for meaning in things that were never designed to give meaning in life. And yet, these things often are what people pursue most to find meaning. You see, apart from understanding that you are made in the image of God and you were created for a relationship with God, and not just that, I'm going to expand it and show you what Jesus said about this. Until you get that, then you're going to struggle to find meaning in all kinds of things that don't really give true meaning. And one of the main things that people struggle with or to try to find meaning in things that were not designed to give meaning in life is they struggle to find meaning in money and possessions. Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with having money. In fact, I hope all of you have lots and lots of it and you give to the church, right? So, look, the fact is money is not good or evil. People say, oh, the Bible says that money is the root of all evil. No, it doesn't. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. And that's an inordinate desire that controls you. So you can try to find meaning by getting the most. I I saw a bumper sticker one time that says, he who gains the most toys wins. Well, that's not true at all. Because when you die... It doesn't matter how many toys you had. There's more to life than money and possessions. Um, Once again, nothing wrong with money. uh, Nothing wrong with having possessions as long as they don't have you. That's very important to understand. Some people try to find meaning in their career. Nothing wrong with having a good career. I hope you have a great one. But that's not what gives true meaning in life. Now, you need a career. You need a job. Okay, but that is not the thing. That's not the only thing or even the main thing. Some people, they think that life consists of how many likes they get on social media or if they can become an influencer or not. And the truth is, and most of you know I'm not a super big fan of social media. It does have some very good benefits, 
but I don't understand it all. Don't want to understand it all. Uh, one of the great blessings when I went on that missions trip to Dominican Republic just a couple weeks ago is that I didn't have to look at the internet or anything for almost a week. That was great. That was great. But the point is, uh, some people try to find meaning in how well known they are, how popular they are, how many likes they get on social media. And that's not why you're here. Some people think that success is what drives you. And there are many different definitions of success. And so that's certainly not where you find your purpose in life. Now, these are not bad things. Don't think, leave here and think that the pastor's preaching against having a career or having some money in the bank. I was not. But I'm saying that until you understand your purpose in relationship with God, you're never going to be able to find true meaning in life. These things are meant to be blessings in life. These things can be conduits of God's blessings, but they're not the main thing. And until we understand that, we're going to drift in life. Until you discover the why, the what, and the how, you're going to feel great discontentment in life. I heard one guy that talked about how that all of his life he struggled and he sacrificed in order to be successful. And he said it this way. He said, I spent all my career climbing the ladder of success. And when I got to the end of my career, I realized that my ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. What would that be like? How many people have lived life that way? You see, this is true. A lot of times we look at people that have a lot of money and we're like, well, that's true for them but it's not true for me. Did you know this is true for the wealthy and the poor? This is true for the powerful and the average and normal. It's true for the successful and the ordinary. Until you discover why, and not only that, what and how, then you're never truly going to find real meaning in life. Now, let me bring this down. Scripture is very clear about our purpose in life. And what we're going to see, and we've read this, this is the third time we've read this passage, uh, speaking from it, um, we find that uh, God wants us to have a relationship with him. We are made in the image of God. We're made on purpose and for a purpose. And nothing in life makes sense or gives lasting meaning apart from a relationship with God. In fact, Jesus Christ said it this way. And I want you to get this because this is more than what we think. The Old Testament writers, the prophets of old, they would often say it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And Jesus took it a step further. Someone asked Jesus, they said, what's the most important commandment in life? And Jesus, being the Son of God, knowing what the Scripture said, he said, Everything in the Bible, and I'm paraphrasing what he said. He said, everything in the Bible can be boiled down to two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, everything hangs on that. Let me just kind of for a second break this down. What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Well, we know what the heart represents. It's the emotions. But if you love God only with your emotions, that's not enough. There are a lot of people that say, oh, I love Jesus or I love God. And they, what they mean is they have a, an emotional attachment to God. They can come to church and they feel the Holy Ghost goosebumps or whatever you want to call it. They get all excited about the music and they feel close to God. Well, that's loving God with your heart. But there is more to it than just loving God with the emotion. Nothing wrong with that. You should. But until you love God with your heart and your soul, what is your soul? Well, there's some debate about this, but that word for soul in the Bible, it can just simply mean yourself, your body, okay? But it also refers to the complete person. Your mind, your heart, or your emotions, 
and your will or your decision-making ability. So let's break that down for a second. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and he added your strength. I'm to love God with my emotions. I'm to love God with my soul. My, in other words, my mind, my, my uh, decision-making ability, the things that I do. I'm to love God with the decisions I make, the actions that I take in life. I'm to love God with my emotions and my actions, and I'm to love God with my mind. Some people are more intellectual than others, and they love the concept of God. They love learning neat stuff about the Bible. They love learning concepts about God, but when it comes to actually putting that into practice, counting them out. It's not enough to love God with your mind. It's not enough to love God with just your decisions. There are many Christians that love God with their actions when it comes to taking a stand against certain kinds of sin. I find it interesting that there are Christians that boycott certain companies because of things that they do, but they never boycott a church because it's filled with gossips. They never boycott a church because it's filled with people that don't love others. They like to point out the sins of others, but not their own sin. You see, until I love God with not just my mind and not just my will or my volition or my, emo my actions, until I love him with more than just my heart, my emotions, but I'm loving him with my mind. I'm loving him with the decisions that I make. I'm loving him with how I live, with my actions. And then he said, your strength. In the book of Romans, the apostle Paul captured this this way. He said, we are to serve God, to love God with our bodies. We're to make them as a living Sacrifice. Have you ever noticed that a lot of people, they like the concept of loving God, but when it comes to their body, they don't actually want to follow through with it? You say, well, what do you mean? What, what, what does that mean? Well, the fact is, you can look up all you want, but until you show up physically, then you're not really loving God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So, now, Jesus said, once again, I'm getting ready to read this, okay, and give you some principles. But Jesus said, look, um, you're to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your body. Now, that's good. And there are a lot of Christians that do that. They go to church. They get the emotional part of it. They give money. They believe the Bible. They read the Bible and pray. They have a relationship with God. They behave like good people should behave. They're nice to others for the most part. And they're, they're, they're kind of kind, you know what I mean? I mean, it's affecting their actions. They don't, they, they don't act like they used to. They don't talk like they used to. So they got that side of it. They're loving God. But the interesting thing is that Jesus didn't leave it there, did he? He said, and you're to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, when you do this, you understand what God requires of us. So it's not enough just to come to church and say, boy, I got some good feelings about the song. It's not enough just to listen to good worship music online and say, well, that's beautiful, or to watch a podcast, or even to listen to a sermon and say, well, that's beautiful. It's not enough just to read the Bible or pray. Are these things important? Yes. It's not enough just to show up to church and serve and do. It's not until we complete it that we truly love God. Now, I'm not trying to pile this list of doing things. You know, that's not my approach, nor do I believe it's the biblical approach to Christianity. So I'm not trying to pile up more and more stuff for you to do. But I'm trying to help each of us understand why we were created in the first place. Until you begin to get this concept, you're not truly going to love God. So let me read it to you from the mouth of God in Genesis chapter one. This is, of course, the creation account. And then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Once again, a reference to the Trinity, I believe personally. God saying, 
Let us make mankind in our own image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God created man, talking about mankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I'm going to give you three points today, but before I do that, I'm going to give you a couple principles from this passage so we'll fully understand it. We serve others because we are created in the image of God. Okay, you're going to see that these words that I'm going to read to you today that I'm going to talk about from this passage show that we're to serve God by serving others. So we serve God because we're made in God's image. We serve God because everyone is made in God's image. Now, there's some people you're going to like more than others, probably, okay? Um, are there going to be some people that you're more impressed by than others? I'm sure there will be. But you've never looked at a person. You've never locked eyes with a person, no matter their level of intelligence, no matter how talented they are, no matter how much money they have, no matter how much influence they have. You've never locked eyes with another human being that was not made in the image of God also. So why do we serve? Because others are made in the image of God. We serve God by ruling over creation as his stewards. He told us we're to, we're to rule, we're to subdue, we're to have dominion over. I'm going to explain that word in a future message. But what does that mean? Well, it includes creation, work, and family. Now, I believe that we have a responsibility to creation, I believe that the Bible is very clear we are not to worship creation. Um, I, as a young man, did some dumb stuff. Um, I remember when I was young, I would just chunk garbage out the window driving down the road, uh, you know, and I would laugh. And people would say, why are you doing that? I'd say, I'm creating jobs. Somebody's got to pick that up which is A, arrogant, and B, dumb, okay? But there came a day, and I want you to listen to me. There came a day when I got convicted over that. Based on Scripture, God said we're to, we're to rule over creation. We're to subdue it. Now, does that mean that we're to worship it like some people do today? Of course not. God has given us responsibility for creation, for work, and for family. So the word multiply means to become much, to make many, to become great. God wants us to be great in our work, uh, to be as good as we possibly can be in our families. The primary meaning of multiply means to have children. Now, some people can't have children, but that uh, everyone, the, the fact is everyone can help children, okay? You can, how can you help children here at this church? We have a children's ministry. We have a youth ministry. You can get involved. You say, well, I'm, I'm beyond those years. If you're a grandparent, uh, that's a great opportunity. In fact, uh, my wife, Kim, she serves in our children's ministry. She directs it. And um, my wife and I, uh, we have three adult children. And we don't have any grandchildren yet. And uh, my wife wants grandchildren probably more than she wants anything else in this life at this point, other than her relationship with Jesus. Um, but she made a statement that just so moved me. She said, well, I don't have any grandkids yet, but God has gifted me with lots and lots of grandkids in our children's ministry. And I thought to myself, man, what a great attitude to have. Everybody can help children. You say, well, I'm not going to do that in the back. And I get that. I don't serve back there because I have to preach up here, okay? But you can give. You can serve somewhere. You can be active and be a part. And so uh, even though maybe you can't have children, 
there is a physical and a spiritual command um, that God has given us to serve, to multiply, to fill the earth. We serve from God's blessing and for God's blessing. This is what I want you to see. And once again, this is a very long introduction, okay? Uh, when he said, and he blessed them, and then he commanded them. He did not uh, command them before he blessed them. And this is a principle. We work from God's grace, not for God's grace. And until you get that in your Christian life, you're going to struggle. There are a lot of people that try to work for God's approval. They want God to be proud of them. And some, because of their earthly relationship with their earthly father, they misunderstand what a biblical relationship should be with our heavenly father. You think that God may be like your father, your earthly father. Maybe he was this way. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe you had an earthly father that had a disapproving attitude. And so everything in life to you is about proving to him that you're good enough, you're smart enough, you can do it. Or maybe you're just wanting his approval. Well, I want you to understand that God tells us that he already approves of us. He already loves us. If it's grace, it's given freely. You can't earn grace. Otherwise, it's not grace. That's why the Bible calls salvation a free gift. I guess that's a little redundant, a free gift. All gifts are free. But God's gift of salvation is just that. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't do anything to keep it. You don't do anything to make God love you more than he loves you already or to approve of you more than he does. Why? Because we work from the blessing, not for the blessing. Until you learn that, you're going to struggle in your Christian life. You're going to have difficulty in your Christian life. And then we serve by being fruitful and faithful. And then I love the command to fill the earth. That is God's command to fill the earth with worshipers of him. So those are the principles. Now I've got three points to give you and I will not be very long on these, okay? So it begs the question, how should then we serve others? How then should we serve others? If God says, I've created you for this and I want you to Subdue the earth and rule over it. And I want you to, and he uses those words. I want you to, as Jesus said, to love God with all your heart, but also to love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? How do we do that? Well, fortunately for us, God has a great variety of gifts. I want you to look around. Go ahead and look around. Those of you at home, maybe you don't have anybody to look around to, but stare at somebody you know, when they come into your house. Or maybe if you're going down the road and you're watching this, pull over because you're going to have a wreck, all right? So, but no, I want you to notice that the people next to you are very different than you are. And that's a good thing, okay? Uh, God has given us a variety of gifts, a variety of people. And if we're made in the image of God, how then should we serve others? We serve God by serving others. So let me give you these thoughts. Number one, we're to serve with compassion. Compassion. Proverbs 19, 17, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord and he will repay you. Now there are many ways to help the poor. You help the poor through giving here at this church because we support missions across the world. Sometimes you do it because God prompts you. I'm going to just share a brief story with you. And I'm not, I hope you understand my purpose in telling this story. It's not to make me out to be the hero of the story because actually I'm the, almost the villain of the story. I was driving down the road where I lived the other day and I saw a man walking on the side of the road and he, he was struggling visibly. His foot was turned over like this and he's walking almost on his ankle. His foot must have been hurting and he was going very slowly and struggling. And it was obvious he looked homeless, okay? His hair was all messed up. His clothes were all messed up. And I didn't hear an audible voice, but it was very clear to me, the voice of the Holy Spirit telling me, you need to give that guy some money. And 
being the very sensitive person that I am to the Spirit of God, I said, I'll do it later, <laughs> you know. I was headed somewhere. In fact, I was taking my lawnmower to get worked on. And I said, I'll do it when I come back. So I drove by him. Well, I was, I don't know, probably close to an hour I was gone, maybe 45 minutes. And I came back, and the guy had not gone very far because he couldn't go very far very fast. And he was on the opposite side, and I, it was traffic, and I couldn't get to him. So I'm like, oh, there he is, and I just zoomed right on past. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this or not, but my encouragement to you is when the Spirit of God speaks to you, you better listen. And I pulled off my exit where I live and it was very clear. Once again, not an audible voice, though God could do that if he wanted to, but I, I'm glad he didn't. But the Holy Spirit said in my heart and in my mind, are you going to disobey me? And then he said, you better do what I tell you to do. And I'm like, yes, sir. And so I turned my car around and drove back and uh, it just was perfect where he was by the time I got back to him. And, you know, when God tells you to give somebody some money, um, if you're like I am, you don't carry a lot of cash. I just carry credit cards, debit cards mostly. Um, but I did happen to have um, what I thought were some ones in my wallet, but they were not. I had a $20 bill in my wallet. And the Holy Spirit was just really clear, helped this guy out. So I just grabbed the 20 and I rolled my window down and I handed him this guy this money. I said, hey, buddy, I want you to go buy yourself some breakfast. And he looked at me and I'll not forget this. The look in his eyes and the way he thanked me was so moving to me that this man truly, truly needed this. And let me tell you something. Are there scam artists out there? You can bet your bottom dollar there are. But let me tell you something. When the Holy Spirit leads you to give something, that's not on you. That's on them. That's on them, not, not you, okay? Now you say, well, Pastor, what is your point? Well, you better learn to serve with compassion. You better learn to have compassion on others. Why? Because God says if you... Lend, if you give to the poor, you're lending to the Lord and he will repay you. Isaiah 117, learn to do good, seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of the orphans and fight for the rights of widows. We're to serve with compassion. Jude 1, and 23. I want you to hear, Jude was the half-brother of Jesus. Here's what he said. Try to help those who argue against you. Does that sound like the political climate we live in nowadays? Do you hate people that are not on the same aisle that you are, <laughs> politically speaking? It's sometimes hard not to hate them. Hello? Anybody in here? All right. Look, God, he says, try to help those who argue against you. Be merciful to those who doubt. You ever see an atheist or an agnostic? And you just get mad at them because they're so adamant that there's no God or they argue and say that religion is for weak-minded people and you get all defensive. I know I do. He said, be merciful to those who doubt. Next time you encounter a, an adamant atheist, you ought to pray for them. Don't feel less than. Don't feel like, well, they're making me feel stupid. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And so rather than being upset with them, you, you ought to pray for them and have compassion on them and ask God to open their eyes. Save some by snatching them as from the very flames of hell itself. In other words, you've got to be really active and, and, and bold. Then he says, as for others, help them to find the Lord by being kind to them. But be careful that you yourselves aren't pulled along into their sins and hate every trace of their sin while being merciful to them as sinners. Now, do you get that God wants us to have compassion? He says, 
we're to serve with compassion. Here's the second principle. We serve in communion. You say, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Communion, we come and we take the elements that represent the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. No, what I'm talking about is serve in communion with our Heavenly Father. In other words, your acts of service, your serving God is only accomplished by serving God by serving others. Does that make sense? Okay. When you are serving God, you're to be serving others. That is in communion with God. John 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will be with you forever. He's talking about the Holy Spirit in case you're wondering. And this is what God promises to each of us. The Holy Spirit will be with you. He's your helper. He will be the one that reminds you of Scripture and reminds you of why you're doing what you're doing. And let me just encourage you. Because sometimes we get weary in the journey. I know I have. And I'm sure you have as well. But listen. He says, Jesus said, I'm going to give you a helper. I'm going to give you somebody that will be with you. I'm going to give you somebody that will encourage you when you're down. Somebody that will lift you up when you need it. Somebody that will be there for you who will remind you of the why. And ladies and gentlemen, when you get the why, then the what and how, they're just details. Because I can promise you this. When you're serving other fallen, sinful human beings, sometimes it's going to be frustrating. Hello. You know why? Because they're just like you. They're not perfect, okay? That's why we say this church is the perfect place for imperfect people. You got to remember that. Why? Because I can promise you that there are going to be times when somebody, maybe they don't speak to you when you come in and you get offended by it. Not thinking about maybe what their day was like or their week was like, or maybe they didn't even see you and you get all upset. I can promise you, if you're looking for perfection, you won't find it in the pulpit of this church. And I promise you, if you come here long enough, I'm going to say something that probably offends you. And you say, well, I didn't come to church to be offended. Well, where do you normally go? Church is as good a place as any, right? All right, so. Look, Jesus says we're to serve in communion with him. Because unless I'm doing this in communion with him, then I'm not going to make it. 1 John 1, 3. Remember, John was one of Jesus' disciples, right? Right? And the Bible tells us that he knew that he was, he referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And listen to what he wrote. First John, different than the gospel of John, he wrote first, second, and third John in Revelation as well as the gospel of John. But here's what he said in first John 1, 3. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that, what was he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. I've actually seen him. I've actually heard about him. He said that he had actually touched him. He'd actually handled him. He had been with them. He's saying, I'm an eyewitness. This is not something I heard. This is not what some snake oil salesman tried to sell me. He said, I was there and I saw him and I know him. He said, we've done this so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. I am to serve in communion with God because that makes the difference. And then finally, we're to serve with commitment. We're to have compassion. We're to serve in communion with God. And we're to serve with commitment. I realize that the pandemic that happened a few years ago has changed the world. It's especially changed the church world. There are fewer than 50% of people that went to church regularly. By regularly, we mean at least a couple times a month. Before the pandemic, 
fewer, less than 50% of those people still go to church regularly. I mean, all you got to do is look around our church. We don't have nearly as many people after the pandemic as we did before it. Now, what's my point? My point is, you got to serve with commitment because sometimes life happens. Sometimes your schedule gets too busy. Sometimes it's more convenient not to be faithful. But it requires commitment. Matthew 28, uh, 20, verse 28, the Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve others. Matthew 10, 2, and if you even give a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. You see, you don't have to be Hercules. You don't have to make Herculean efforts. You don't have to be Billy Graham. You don't have to be Mother Teresa. You don't have to be a missionary that goes to some place that you've never heard of. I always was afraid when I was a young man that God was going to call me to a place where there were giant spiders and I was going to wake up every morning with a giant spider. I don't know why I had this, uh, this crazy idea. But I thought if I really committed my life to God, he's going to make me go serve somewhere where there's a giant tarantula that's going to get on my chest. And I am terrified of spiders. And I was just like, oh, God, I won't serve you very long because I'll die of a heart attack if that happens to me. Listen, he's saying whatever you do, if you do it for him, in communion with him. Now, he's not saying that you should be content with just tiny little effort. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying that every effort to serve God by serving others is rewarded. You know, that's why we talk about next steps. Some of you, your next step is you just need to step into serving. And some of you have been in that your next step is you need to step up, not just step out, but step up. Maybe you need to lead. Maybe you need to be more involved. You see, he said, if you give even a cup of cold water in his name, you'll be rewarded. And then I end with this, Romans 12, 5, we are all parts of his one body and each of us has different work to do. And since we're all one body in Christ, we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. I was watching some college football last night. Praise God. Um, Very happy about that. And one thing I noticed, okay, no, I didn't watch LSU. Why would I watch LSU? I'm a Christian, all right? So... watching North Carolina, all right? So, and the reason I know God is a Tar Heel fan is because the sky is Carolina blue, all right? So, that is, that is God's team, all right? So, maybe I was watching, and uh, as North Carolina demolished the offensive line of South Carolina, something dawned on me. If just one offensive lineman is not doing his part, the team suffers. And if that's true in football, it's truly mega true in the church. You see, we all belong to each other. We all have something to do. And so the greatest ability that you have is availability. You may not be the most talented, That's okay. God made you like you are. But your ability is not what matters. It's your availability that matters most. Now, I I understand that there are certain things that, you know, if you come to me and say, Pastor, I'm going to sing, and you can't sing, no, you're not. All right? So you're going to to greet people. You're going to smile. You're going to serve in children's ministry. You're going to do something else. You're not going to sing. Because uh, you say, I heard one guy was like, hey, God gave me this song. And I heard him sing it. And I'm like, God didn't give you that because God writes better songs than that. So, but my point is, you've got something that you can do. 
and the best of ability is availability. All right? Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God, what it's so practical and what it means to us and how it opens our eyes and our hearts. And I pray that you'd help each of us today to have our spiritual ears in tune with what you're saying to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.